الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الى يوم الدين اما بعد ان شاء الله we'll, we'll start today what, what book are we covering the journey to Allah. Does anybody memorize what is the actual title in Arabic? Al Mahajjah fi Sayyir Ad Dulja. And what's a Mahajjah? What is a Mahajjah? Yeah, go ahead. A clear path. A clear path. And what's a Dulja? That, that, that night, that, that last part of the, the night. Okay? The last part of the night. Tayyip. The, the book is authored by who? Ibn Rajab. What's Ibn Rajab's name? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's not fair. No cheating. <laughs> What's his name? Huh? Uh, Tayyip. So uh, Rajab, yes, yeah, so Rajab was the nickname of his grandfather, who's Abdurrahman. But what's his name? Tayyip, his name is the same as his grandfather. Abdurrahman. Tayyip, Abdurrahman ibn who? Ibn Ahmed ibn Abdurrahman. But that Abdurrahman, right, was his grandfather. His, na they, his nickname was, was Rajab. And he's the one who Ibn Rajab, يعني, his grandson, used to attend his grandfather's lessons. يعني, Ibn Rajab used to attend the lessons of his grandfather. Some say when he was as young as three years old, for sure when he was four. And he studied with him first. In what city? In Baghdad, right, because uh, Ibn, Ibn Rajab was born in Baghdad. After the death of his grandfather, that's when the family moved to where? Damascus. Damascus. Yeah, Damascus. Okay. Uh, Ibn Rajab was born in what year? 736. 736 after the Hijrah. One of his most famous sheikhs was who? We've studied many of his books, huh? Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Qayyim died in what year? <laughs> Boy, <laughs> mashallah. mashallah, definitely after 7:36. Yes, that's uh, it's great. Huh. I, I, this stuff is. I'm, I'm not just doing it to test you. You know, if you're a history buff, there, there's reasons for this stuff, and it's important that you know. When did Ibn Qayyim die? 751. 751. How old was Ibn Rajib when Ibn Qayyim died? 14 or 15. Okay. He studied with Ibn Qayyim for a year, solid, like straight. La Zamahu. Right? And Ibn Qayyim, you know, at that, at that point uh, in his life was uh, he was He was free for teaching. Like that's, that's what he did. He didn't have administrative responsibilities and so forth. So Ibn Rajab studied, and, and, and he had a great effect on Ibn Rajab, as it, and it comes out in his writings. Tayyip. Mesh. Uh, from what we covered last week, what is the major usul or principle or foundation that this book seeks to establish? That a person does not enter paradise by his deeds alone. That a person does not enter paradise by his deeds alone. Independently, one's deeds do not enter him into paradise. Tell you, the author, inshallah, what we're going to get to today is why that is so important, right? I know last week some people were saying, well, we, you know, they were trying to get to the end. Well, why this, that, and what's this mean, and why is this so important? And why? We're going to get there. That is the point of reading a book is that you actually go through the process so that you appreciate when you get the answer to your questions. Otherwise, when you just spoon fed everything, right? It, it, the, the, the problem with being spoon fed is that it usually goes in one ear and out the other. Yes, maybe there's gonna be some benefit from it, you learn from it at the time. But by going through the process of reading, it sticks. Bi'idnillah. And this is why what we're doing is not a class in the sense that we're taking every single word, dissecting it, breaking it down. It's a guided reading. We want to 
read what Ibn Rajab said. We want to benefit from what he says, and it won't be a lot of additions uh, to what he says, but there will be clarification along the way. So with that being said, inshallah, let's pick up from, uh, uh, before we get there, just so that we can recap everything. The, a person does not enter, that's, this is the uh, asl, the foundation, the principle that Ibn Rajab is establishing is that a person by his deeds alone does not enter Jannah. One's deeds are not enough independently to enter a person into Jannah. What evidence does the author use to establish this? And we can use broad categories of evidence. He, so he uses, first he starts off with a hadith. He starts off with a hadith and he mentions Two different narrations of the hadith of Abi Huraira, two narrations of the hadith of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And why does he start with the, with the hadith and not the ayat? Even though we know that the Quran, in terms of its strength, if you will, of proof, is stronger than the hadith. Why does he start with the hadith here? Yeah, I mean, the normal way that, that, that a person would start, the normal way that a person would bring evidence is they would start with ayat from the Quran. And you don't have to talk about who narrated it, uh, what book it's in, which, uh, which author said it was authentic, or which you know, scholar of hadith said it was authentic. You don't have to do that with the Quran. Just bring the ayat. Why did he start with the hadith and then mention the ayat? Yes? Is the hadith the same way the Quran? Like, does it come from Abu Hurairah? Abu Hurairah? Does it sound like it's that? That's not, that's not why he started with the, with the, with the hadith. Uh, yes? Ah, because the ahadith are explicit, explicitly mention this rule, or that, that he's that he's attempting to establish, right? You don't you don't. There's no uh, what they would call istimbat or or need to go back and try to derive the ruling, right? It's right there in front of you. The Prophet ﷺ said exactly that. None of you will enter Jannah because of his deeds, right? By his deeds. Okay. Tell you. And then the author mentions uh, uh, three passages from the Quran that we've talked about last week. We are now on page 19 where the author, Rahmatullahi alayhi, says some of the Salaf said. Yes, Fadl Sheikh. Some of this, uh, as, as, as our. St start, uh, st start off by, by, uh, by saying uh, the, the, the author, Rahimahullah ta'ala, says. But because it's important for, especially when these type of sittings, that we learn the etiquettes of, of reading the books of the scholars aloud, right? We're reading them out loud, and we want to make dua for him. Subhanallah, yani Ibn Rajib, we're benefiting from his knowledge. And yani it's only fair that we make dua for him and, and, and say, may Allah have mercy on him, right? And inshallah, that dua yani is beneficial to him and his great. Doctor, I, I was trying to get, and I'm not trying to take time, I was going to try to begin out with that. Uh, Hakadah has given to us to read the book by Ibn Rajab. Taib, Bismillah. Is your mic on? Okay, perfect. Uh, some of the some of the Salaf said the hereafter consists either of Allah's forgiveness or the fire, and this world is either a source of Allah's protection or a source of destruction. On his deathbed, Muhammad Ibn Rasi bid farewell to his companions saying, peace upon you, either to the fire or to the forgiveness of the law. So notice here, uh, the author, after mentioning the hadith and the ayat from the Quran, he mentions some of the statements of the Salaf, which uh, reinforce his interpretation of the text. And that is because here, uh, as some of the Salaf said, the hereafter consists of either Allah's forgiveness or the fire. Not, it, notice he didn't say either your good deeds or the fire or even Jannah or the fire. He's ta he, he mentions Allah's forgiveness because a person doesn't get to Jannah without Allah's forgiveness. And this is the point. This is why the author is mentioning these statements from, from the Salaf. Now, okay. So up until this point, the author has established his, his proof. Now, he wants to mention some of the some of what could be un understood to be a counter argument, if you will, meaning that there are texts 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, enter paradise for what you used to do. Be mad kuntum ta'am. Be mad kuntum ta'amanu. Based on what you used to do. Type. So how do we understand these uh, ayat, these particular texts that may seem to contradict the point that the author has already made? Are we, we clear on that? I, I need, what we're trying to do is understand the reading, like guided reading. Why is the author now going to mention these things? All right? So, go ahead. As for the saying of Allah, whose meaning is, that is the garden you will be made to inherit for what you did. And the next verse, and the next ayah, the tr meaning of the, tra meaning of the ver verse is, eat and drink with relish for what you did before in days gone by. The scholars differed concerning the meaning of this, falling into two opinions. Okay, Wh where's the, what's the problem? I'm, I'm genuinely asking, what's the issue, yes? Not some of the salaf, where the Prophet said, said, none of your deeds alone. Yeah, your, your deeds won't enter you into paradise. And then these eyes that said, enter paradise for what you used to do. How do we, okay, we got the problem? Okay, let's, now, let's look at how the scholars interpreted that. He said there's two different interpretations. Now, one, entry into paradise is accorded by his mercy. But the assignment of ranking and station in paradise is done in accordance to the deeds one performed. Ibn Uyayna said, they were of the opinion that salvation from the fire occurs through the forgiveness of Allah. Entrance into paradise occurs by his grace and the, appoint and the apportioning of ranking occurs in accordance to one's deeds. Okay, so this is one interpretation of Ibn Uyayna, rahmatullah uh, Ibn Uyayna uh, died in 198. Eight, wallahu alam. Uh, but he lived for a long time, so he he reached the the yani some of the younger of the tabi'i, right? Some of the younger uh, ones from most of the tabi'i. So Ibn Uyayna said they were of the opinion. Yani that gives the the uh, indication that this is not like one person's opinion or two people's opinion, but that this was something that was widespread. Not that there was ijma, not that there was consensus amongst them. But, but that this was not a, a strange opinion. That salvation from the fire, which is what? And najat, right? Len yunji ahadan minkum amaluhu. None of your actions will save him. Okay, so they were of the opinion that salvation from the fire occurs through forgiveness from Allah. Okay, entry into paradise. So that, that's from Maghfirah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Entry into paradise occurs by Allah Azza wa Jal's fadl, his grace. Okay? But the ranks in paradise, the Prophet alayhi salatu uh, he, he talked about the, the ranks of the people in paradise, how some will look up at, the, at those lofty stations, yani, as if they were looking at faraway stars, because that's the distance yani, in between some of the ranks uh, of paradise. So the ranks are apportioned according to, to deeds. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for what you used to do, be kuntum ta'malun, then that's referring to, that, that those actions are, are referring to what will apportion a person's rank in, in paradise, not that they will enter because of, of those deeds. Type. That's one interpretation. Now, next. Number two that the ba which has been mentioned in his sayings for what you did nah. be mad kuntum as the story. right be mad kuntum ta'malun or be ma asleftum fil ayyam al khaliya nah. for what you did before in days gone by is the ba used to indicate causality sabab or sabab mm -hmm. hence the meaning is that Allah has appointed deeds to be the means for entry into paradise the ba which has been assigned in his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam not that the not a sign, but the bad which has been negated. Negated. Mm -hmm. Saying actions alone will not cause one to enter paradise is the bad indicating comparison and compensation, muqabala, and replacing like for like. 
Mu'awida. Yeah, and that change that instead of Mu'awida, it should say Mu'awada. Mu'awada. Wada. Yeah. That's a dot there? Yeah, that's a dot. No. But it should, there should have be it, the, the, the wow should have a fetha on it, not a kisra. It's not Mu'awida, it's Mu'awada. Mm. Continue, sir? No. The meaning of the hadith would then be that none deserves entry into paradise by virtue of the deeds he has performed. Through this explanation, the erroneous understanding that paradise is the embursement of deeds is dispelled. The understanding that the person, by virtue of his deeds alone, has the right to be granted entry into paradise by Allah. Just as one who pays the price for a commodity has the right that it be given him by the seller. Okay, so stop there. So let, let us understand. Okay, go ahead. This explanation. Finish this that. explanation makes clear that the actual entry comes to pass by the grace and mercy of Allah, and that deeds are a cause for the entry into paradise. All right, somebody want to summarize that for us? So, so the second one, okay. So this, this just requires for us to understand just a little bit uh, from the, the usage of bat in the Arabic language, right? So when the Prophet ﷺ said, none of you will enter Jannah, be amalihi, be amalihi, okay. So just be his actions. Just keep that little bat in mind. Be his actions, and then eat and drink, huh? Eat and drink in paradise. Be man. Be what you used to do. Like. So, what the author is saying is that the the bat that's used in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the one that the Prophet ﷺ is negating, that you will enter B, I mean, those actions, that is Ba al muawadah or muqabila. How is that used? That's used when we start talking about buying and selling. Okay? So I say, for example, become hadha, right? How much is, how much is this? Hadha bi miat alf dollar. Okay, so this is a hundred thousand dollars. And think about two people, right? The, the, they they want this product that's a hundred thousand uh, dollars. They go to the seller. One of them, he's like, "Hey, hey, I ain't nothing to give you, but you want you can turn that over. I, I, I'd love to have it." And the other one, he worked hard. You know, he was he tried to save up his money, but he can only get fifty thousand. And he's saying, look, this is what I got. I got $50,000. So the guy gives it to him for $50,000. The, the guy that didn't come with nothing, he's not giving him anything. Right? Guy comes with $50,000. Does he deserve a product that's worth $100,000? No. But he did something. He put something forth. Okay? And, and he, but he doesn't deserve it. Okay? It's, it's actually not a fair, it's not fair compensation for, for the product that he's getting. We clear on that so far? Okay. But because he had something, because he had something to put forth, what he put forth was the reason, was a reason, huh, that he got that particular product and that another person didn't. Or, so, so far, so, yeah, so good? Yes. Okay. All right. So think about that. It'll become clear as we go along. But I just want you to put that concept in your head. Think about that as a person's <laughs> actions. The actions that a person does is not enough to get them in the gender. But if a person doesn't even try, right, they're not doing anything, then they're not even in the ballpark of having some of the reasons by which they may get that thing that they're desiring. Okay? Yes? Is it safe to say that Allah has the authority to give, to give someone the, the permission to enter because of what they did, but we don't have the permission to get what we we the, the authority, permission, I, I don't want to use those words right now. I think, I think the concept is going to become a lot clearer as we get up to page 35, 36, inshallah, which, we, I mean, we're still 15 pages away. So we want, to work, we want to work to get there. I just want you to get this basic concept in your head of somebody buying something. What they have is not enough to get what they want, but it is in the ballpark, right? It's, it's one of the, it's a, a means of them getting that thing that they desire, okay? So, what the Prophet is negating in the hadith, according to this interpretation, 
He's negating that a person's deeds are appropriate compensation for Jannah. So if we look at Jannah as this product, I'm coming to purchase it, okay? That the deeds, no matter how much a person has done, it's not enough to, to get that product. We clear on that? All right, that's important to understand. And this is what the author is saying is being negated. What is being affirmed, okay, is that the actions are a cause. They are a means of that person entering gender, even though it's not enough. I want you to go back to page 20 and read number two again. Follow along. It's going to become clearer as we go. And then I want you to go back and read this yourself. Yeah, go ahead. That the bad. That the bad which has been mentioned in his sayings for what you did, for what you did before in days gone by, is the bad used to indicate causality, sabab. Hence the meaning is that Allah has appointed deeds to be the means for entry into paradise. Th those deeds are means for entering paradise, but they're not the price for paradise. Hmm. Okay? No, no. All right, keep going. The bad which has been negated in his but, but Believe wasted. me, just put this stuff in your head. When it all comes together at the end, I'm, be idnillah, you'll have that light bulb moment. It's coming, inshallah. Nah. The bad which has been negated in his alayhi salatu wasalam saying, actions alone will not cause one to enter paradise, is the bad indicating comparison and compensation, muqabala, and replacing like for like, mu'awada, mu'awada. Yeah. The meaning of the hadith would then be that none deserves entry into paradise by virtue of the deeds he has performed. Keep that in mind right there. Highlight that. Keep going. Through this explanation, the erroneous understanding that paradise is the embarrassment of deeds is dispelled. I, I don't, the, the, the word embarrassment is not something we tend to use it's too really much. Uh, up. I in, looked it up. In English... Uh, I mean, American English. Maybe, maybe compensation. Themen is, is the word in, in, in Arabic. The price, the value of, compensation for, right? That paradise, right, is, is the compensation of one's deeds. That this becomes dispelled. As if a person, through the deeds that they have done, have reached a level where their deeds are valued at the same value as paradise. And therefore, they switch this with that, right? So this... You know, this car is worth $50,000. You have $50,000 here. You have a car here. You give the $50,000, you take the car. It's a, it's a like for like. It's equal. Well, what's being dispelled here is that the deeds that a person does, they're trading it off agenda. It's not equal. Okay? Now, it's dispelled. The understanding that the person, by virtue of his deeds alone, has the right to be granted entry into paradise by a law just as one who pays the price for a commodity has the right that it be given him by the seller. This explanation makes clear that the actual entry comes to pass by the grace and mercy of the law and that deeds are a cause for the entry into paradise. Very good. Zakal, okay, keep going. Therefore, actual entry into paradise is dependent upon the grace of the law, his forgiveness and mercy. He is the one who blessed the person with the means and the result of that means. Hence, entry is not a direct outcome of actions in and of themselves. It is recorded in the Sahih that the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah, blessed and exalted, said to paradise, you are my mercy. I show my mercy through you. It should be to whomever Amen. I will of my servants. Amen. Continue, sir. Yes. The servants have no right over him that he must render. Never. Neither in his presence is any effort wretched. Wasted, basically, here. Okay. So in, in, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no effort that is put forth by anybody will be wasted. If they in Allah, in Allah, la and Allah azza wa jalla not cause the, the ajr of the, the good doers to go to waste. Now, if they are punished, then by his justice, if they are in bliss, then by his beneficence, he is the kind, the vast. Now, uh, now we've established that Jannah huh, is not the price, or is, 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 that there is no price that a person can pay 
that will allow them to deserve Jannah. Jayid? Tayyip. We got a problem, another problem about to come up that the author is going to deal with. Uh, your favorite ayat, too, by the way. Come on, let's go. <laughs> oh, wow, yes. How'd you know it's my favorite? Shake, shake. Keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Alhamdulillah is the embursement of every favor. What does that mean? Alhamdulillah is the embursement of every favor. Thamanu uh, kulli ni'mah. So, alhamdulillah is the price that we have to pay for every favor. For every favor you get, it has to be, it has to be uh, paid for with alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. and that, that's the meaning of this title. All right? Tayyip. If it is said, but Habib ibn Shaheed reported Al Hassan as saying, Alhamdulillah is the embursement of every favor, and La ilaha illallah is the embursement for paradise. In other words, Al Hassan al Basri is saying, Look, La ilaha illallah, that you, you pay that for it, and, 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 and Jannah is the, the commodity that you're buying with La ilaha illallah. How do we understand that? It, it, it basically means that, yeah, Jannah does have a price, and it's la ilaha illallah. Okay? Tell you. The meaning of this statement has also been reported. So, from so, so first of all, how would you respond to that? How would you respond to that alone? If it was just, you just had that part. Forget what's coming next. Yes? Uh, okay. Somebody else. Strictly from an Usuli perspective. Usuli, okay. Hmm. Is the state, huh? Uh, how would you respond to, if, if you have these ahadith, ayat from the Quran, other statements of the Salaf that establish one thing, and over here, you have a statement of Al Hassan al Basri, which seems to contradict it. You don't have to figure out, you can't figure out any way to harmonize between them. Mm. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the. No, 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 no. Bismillah. Listen closely. The statement of any tabi'i is not proof in Islam. Oh. That, that's, that's the part I want you to understand. Wow. If we have statement of Allah, his prophet, alayhi salatu was and it's clear that the salaf have interpreted those statements in a, in a certain way. Okay? And then you have a statement of somebody else from the Tabi'i that contradicts that understanding, okay? And you can't figure out how to harmonize. It's, it's a very simple issue. Just leave it. Just leave it. Keep it moving, right? Now, if inshallah, I mean, with, with, with proper understanding, hopefully you can figure out a way to harmonize between understanding it in a, in a different light. Maybe it's contextualized or decontextualized so you didn't understand it properly or whatever. But ultimately, ultimately, there is legitimate differing amongst the Salaf on certain issues, right? None of their statements independently serve as proof in Islam. So it makes people ahl sunnah and not people who follow tariqah and, or those like them. Nah. Keep going, Shaykh. The meaning. The meaning of this statement has also been reported from the Prophet Alayhi Salaam on the authority of Anas. Abdullah and others. Even though the Islam of all these hadith contain weaknesses, the meaning is supported by the saying of Allah. Ah, okay. So we got the statement from Al Hassan al Basri, right? Then it looks like there's some hadith, even though they're weak. Then we got this ayah. In the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah hashtara. من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة. Allah has bought. He used the term bought. اشترى. And we we're talking about now buying and selling, right? And we talked about the B, يعني using that B for buying and selling. Allah has bought from the believers their selves, أنفسهم وأموالهم, and their wealth. At what? بأن لهم الجنة. So. Jannah is, is the commodity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Afwan. Jannah is, is like the, the money here. Okay? 
Allah Azza wa uses Jannah, purchases with Jannah as if it was money, the selves and the wealth of some people. So he buys the, their selves and their wealth and he gives them Jannah. Doesn't that sound like, where, where's the grace of Allah? Where's the forgiveness? Where's all of that? That's, that's not being mentioned here. Are we clear with a problem where there's an apparent issue? But we don't, we don't get it. Tight. Back up. Back up. None of you will enter Jannah huh. based solely on his deed. Okay. We got that so far? Even if that deed includes jihad, dying for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, giving all of one's wealth, even if it includes that? Yes or no? Yes. Tell you. Hey. Fast forward. We all agree that that's, that's what the Prophet said. Now fast forward. We got this ayah here. The ayah says what? Allah gives you Jannah. Huh? He, with Jannah, he buys yourself and your wealth. So if you give yourself and your wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you get Jannah. There's no mention of mercy of Allah, his forgiveness, his grace, none of that. Correct? Is that, I'm saying, are we understanding? No. Okay, so that's the issue, and then the author is going to answer that, right? Because this appears to be contradictory to the premise that he's laid out. So now we have to understand, look, Ikhwan, please, we have to learn how to read. This is why we're doing this. All right. The author establishes an, a premise. He says, this is what it is. Then he's bringing you, okay, if somebody says, well, what about this? Now we're going to answer that. So he already answered the other one. What was the first, what was the first counter argument or, or first, uh, you know, textual evidence that, that he used to perhaps counter the original point? Not, huh? Enter into Jannah be mad kuntum ta'maloon. Based on what you used to do. How did he answer that? He said that the scholars have two ways of interpreting that. And both of those ways fall right in line with the original principle, which is you can't enter Jannah by your deeds alone. Okay. Now we got another argument, which is, but Allah said, huh? well, Al Hassan al Basri said, we got these weak hadith, but all of that's supported by the statement of Allah, and Allah has shallah min al mu'minina, and fusahum wa amwalahum, bi anna lahum al Jannah. How do we answer that? Tell you, read, read the uh, translation of Aisha. <coughs> Allah has bought from the believers their selves and their wealth in return for the garden, Jannah. They fight in the way of Allah. They kill and they are killed. It is a promise binding on him in the Torah, the Injil, and the Quran. And who is truer to his contract than Allah? Mm. Rejoice then in the bargain that you have made. Tell you, what contract? Isn't that every buying and selling is a contract, correct? And Allah has given us a contract here. Say, you give me your wealth, you give me yourself, I'll give you Jannah. Nothing about forgiveness and mercy. Mm. Here, paradise has been appointed the inbursement for self and the property. The response to this is that Allah, glorious and exalted. Okay, the response to this. So what is the author doing to right now? He's going, to, he's going to answer what appears to, contra what appears to be contradicting his original point. Yes. Bismillah. And I want you to pay attention when things like that come up. The response to it. Okay, boom, okay. All right. Here's the i'tirad or the, the apparent contradiction, right? And here's the response to that. The response to this is that Allah, glorious and exalted is he through his beneficence, mercy, and kindness, and generosity has addressed his servants in a way that would encourage them to obey him using language and concepts that they can readily understand and relate to. He placed himself in the position of a buyer and debtor and placed them in the position of sellers and creditors. Then, this then encourages them to answer his call and rush to his obedience. In reality, however, everything belongs to him and is granted by his grace and mercy. The self and property belong to him. In the first place, yes. yourself, your wealth, belongs to Allah in the first place. So 
in reality, can you sell something to somebody that they already own and you don't really own? Uh, think about it like this. You went, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, this actually happens sometimes. You go to your neighbor, you borrowed a drill, right? And you, you put something up in the house and whatever. So you go borrow the drill from your neighbor. You keep the drill so long, your neighbor got to come back to you and borrow back. <laughs> hey, can I borrow that drill you got? You ain't. Well, so think about it like this. Think about the neighbor. You, you say, you know what? I, I really don't feel like uh, I'm, I'm kind of it's tight right now. I can't let you borrow this. But I can sell it to you for $25. It's his in the first place. Can you sell something to somebody that already belongs to him? So here the author is saying, in reality, however, everything belongs to Allah mm -hmm. and is granted by his grace and mercy the self and the property belong to him keep going and this is why oh boy Mukhtar come on keep your finger under there shake <laughs> <laughs> middle of the page uh, uh, middle of the page above the eye above the eye okay the self and the property belong to him the self and the property belong to him. And this is why he commanded us to say at the onset of calamity, okay. inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong and to yeah. him are we returning. Yeah. This Again, hold on, hold on one second. Not inna lillah, inna lillah. Huh? And not wa inna ilayhi raji'un, wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Huh? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong, and to him are we returning. And if you switch that around, it might even make, make it clearer. And to him we are returning. Right? In the present. In the present. Not to him we will return. No, to him we are returning. Every, presently. Right? So we belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we are in constant state of returning to him, getting closer to that meeting with him. Now, despite this, he commends those who expend their selves and properties for his sake, comparing them to sellers and creditors. Therefore, man is likened to someone who has property which he can sell and give as a loan to someone else who does not possess it. In the same way, all deeds come about as a result of his grace and mercy. Yet, he commends those who perform them attributes the deeds to them and appoints them to be a show of gratitude and return for his favors. I'm, I want to go back over uh, just to this last uh, paragraph on page 23. Okay. Despite the fact, so it says despite this. Everybody on page 23? Despite this. What is this? Despite what? Huh? Right. Despite the fact that everything belongs to Allah in the first place. He commends those who expend their selves and property for his sake, comparing them to sellers and creditors. Therefore, man is likened to someone who has property, which he can sell and give as a loan to someone else who does not possess it. Tight. Check this out. He says, in the same way, all deeds come about yes. as a re all deeds, everything we do. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the author is going to uh, talk about on page 25, inshallah, but just keep it in mind right now. All deeds come about as a result of his grace and mercy. Like what? Like your wudu and your salat and your giving of zakat and your fasting of Ramadan, your performance of hajj and your bidul walidain. All of that is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you to that. It's all from his grace and his mercy that you do these things in the first place, the fact that you are a Muslim, that Allah guided you to Islam. Yet, yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commends the people who perform them. What is them? The righteous actions. Okay? Make sure we understand what? Our pronouns all the time. Make sure we get your pronouns down. Those who perform them, he attributes the deeds to them, meaning you are the one who has performed that. If you pray, then you pray. It's, it's you who pray. And he appoints them to be a show of gratitude and return for his faith. In other words, that the good deeds that a person does, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts them as a show of shukr, right? 
uh, for the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? He counts them as, as you showing gratitude to him. Even though ultimately it is Allah who is the one who guided everyone to do any of the good that they have ever done. Keep it going. 24. Elucidation of the meaning of favors. Like, what are favors? What, what does that mean when we say that these favors are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If, if you go back to page 22, you'll see that alhamdulillah is the what? Embursement of everything. Uh, it, it is the thamen, right? It is the price that is due for every favor. What favor? What are favors in the first place? Clear? So this is the question that the author is going to answer, starting now. Ibn Majah? Ibn Majah, rahimallah, records on the authority of Anas, an, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that there is no favor which Allah bestows upon his servant for which he says, alhamdulillah, except that which he gave was better than that which he took. It, um, so go down to the footnote, what he gave was the statement of praise. Yani what, the, what the servant, what the slave gave is his statement, alhamdulillah. Okay? What he took or what he received was the favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Mm. This was also stated. Okay, this was also stated by Umar ibn al-Aziz, uh, ibn, uh, Umar ibn abdul aziz yeah. al-Hasan, and others from amongst the Salaf. Mm -hmm. The meaning of this has troubled a great number of scholars, past and present. But if it is understood in the light of our preceding discussion, its meaning is obvious. The meaning of favor mentioned in the hadith is worldly favor. Right, so there is no yani, worldly favor which Allah bestows upon his servant, but which he says, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so just think, for example, Allah is a person has been fasting all day. And then when it comes time to break their fast, they have their dates and their water, and they say, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so this is Elijah's favor upon them is that he, he gave them food and drink, right? And then they, which is a worldly favor. They respond with, Alhamdulillah. There's no worldly favor which Allah bestows upon his servant, which he says, Alhamdulillah, except that which he gave, yani the Alhamdulillah, was better than what he received, yani the worldly favor. Okay. Keep, Sheikh, read that again, the meaning of the, okay, the, the meaning of favor mentioned in the hadith. The, men, the meaning of favor mentioned in the hadith is worldly favor. And the statement of praising Allah is one of the religious favors. And the fact that Allah guided you to saying alhamdulillah is a, is a religious favor. No. Religious favors are better than worldly favors. Now, because the favor of praising Allah has been attributed to the servant, since he articulated nah, it. He, he, the, the servant is the one who's actually saying, what? Alhamdulillah, right? So it's attributed to him. Yeah. Allah considers him as giving greater favor, wow, as a return for the original favor. Mm -hmm. This is why it is mentioned in the narration, Alhamdulillah, with a praise that befits and suffices, su suffices his favors, represses his retribution, and acts as a re as return for his addition. Wow. When understood in this light, the statement of praise is the embursement of paradise. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Alhamdulillah, hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yudafi' niqamah wa yukafi' mazida. When understood in this light, the statement of praise is the embursement of paradise. 1.3, now. Mm -hmm. Both paradise and deeds are from the grace of Allah. Therefore, to be correct, both paradise and deeds are granted to the believing servants by the grace and mercy of Allah. This is why yeah, they pay, pay, pay attention to this ayah because he's going to give us a beautiful tafsir, inshallah. So he says both paradise and the deeds that are granted to a believing servants they're both by Allah's Azawajal's grace and his mercy. We already established that paradise. Nobody's going to enter by their deeds alone. But even the deeds themselves are from the grace and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, this is being repeated and being reinforced in different ways. And it's really, really important because it's leading up to what the author really wants us to understand. Now, this is why the inhabitants of paradise 
will say upon entering it, Alhamdulillah, الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسول ربنا بالحق. Praise be to Allah who guided us to this. We would not have been guided had Allah not guided us. Verily, the messengers of our Lord came with the truth. Subhanallah, bihamdi. Continue, sir. Hey. After they acknowledged that it was through the favor of Allah that they were granted paradise, and that it was through his favor that they were granted the, the accord to enact, to enact the means leading to it. Why? Because what did they say? They said, Alhamdulillah, hadana lihada. Right? All praise due to Allah has guided us to this. We would not have been guided had Allah not guided us. Right? So they acknowledged that it was through the favor of Allah that they were granted paradise and that it was through his favor that they were granted the accord to enact the means leading to it, meaning the deeds that lead to paradise. So they praised him for both. That is his guidance. And after having praised him. And after having praised him for this, they are rewarded with the call. And tilkumul jannah. Their deeds were attributed to them. Now that, behold, this is the garden. Now, I'm just, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, behold, this is the garden you will be made to inherit for what you did. Their deeds were attributed to them, and they were shown appreciation for them. It is with this overall meaning that some of the Salaf said, when a servant commits a sin and says, my Lord, you decreed this for me. In other words, th this person who has committed the sin, they try to blame Allah for it. Mm -hmm. And they say, but Allah, this is what you decreed for me to do. Right? Like the one who went to Omar radiallahu ta'ala and who, when Omar was going to cut his hand off for stealing. And he said, he said, but Allah decreed yani, that, that I steal. He said, yeah, and Allah decreed that I cut your hand off. <laughs> It's not, we're not going to use that excuse. Right? Nah. His, his Lord will say, you are the one who sinned and disobeyed me. Now, if the servant says, my Lord, I erred, committed a sin, and wrought evil, Allah will respond by saying, I decreed this upon you, and I will forgive you. This, 1.4, misery and felicity occur through his justice and mercy. Yani justice, mer misery, mercy, felicity. Yeah, go ahead. The true purport of his, alayhi salatu wasalam's words, your actions alone will not save any of you. Actions alone will not cause one to enter paradise. Can be further understood when it is realized that the reward of good deeds multiplied manifold only comes about by the beneficence and grace of Allah, mighty and magnificent. He recompenses. Yeah, yeah, pay attention to this part here because as we know, the Prophet as mentioned in several hadith, that the, the action, any deed that a person does is multiply what? 10, 10, to 10 to 700 times. And for some deeds, even more, even more than that. No good deed that a person does goes unmultiplied. Mm. Every good deed that a person does is multiplied. This is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace and mercy, subhanAllah. But, but listen to what he's going to say. Go ahead. He recompenses a good deed tenfold to seven hundredfold to whatever he wills. Were he to re recompense a good deed with its like, in the same way that he does for an evil deed, good deeds would never have the strength to render void the evil deeds, and one would surely be destroyed. Understand that. Understand that. And this is this. If this alone doesn't allow you to understand the grace Whoa. and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a person to enter paradise. If it was about your good deeds and your bad deeds and your good deeds were not multiplied, nobody would make it. Nobody. If it was just about your good deeds versus your, your evil deeds. Tell you. But Allah is a gel out of his mercy multiplies those deeds, the good deeds, 10 to 700 times, and the bad deeds, he doesn't multiply them. Now, keep going, Shaykh. Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, said, while describing good deeds, if one is an ally, wali, of Allah, and there remains 
and Adam's weight of good after the mutual recompense. What, what, what does that mean? After the mutual recompense. Meaning, here, what, what he's talking about is by the iqtisas, after, after the people come and take their good deeds from, from that person. Um, Me meaning the, the injustices that were done to others. Ghiba, you know, spe speaking evil about them behind their backs, taking their money, or, uh, you know, falsely oppressing them, injustice, uh, hit hitting your kids when they didn't deserve it, all of that stuff. Right? So then, if there just remains an Adam's weight of good that a person has done, after all of that has happened, Allah would. Increase this manifold mm -hmm. such that he enter such that he enters paradise through it yes. or because of it. If he be one, if he is one for whom misery is decreed, the angel says, My Lord, his good deeds have vanished. Yet many more people remain seeking mutual recompense. Yeah, his good deeds are gone, but it's still a lot of people they want they, they want their hot. They want their rights. He will person. he will reply, take their evil deeds and add them to his evil deeds. Yeah, take their evil deeds, since, they, since they don't, he doesn't have any more good to give them, then take their evil deeds and add them to his evil deeds. Yeah. Then prepare for him a place of torment in the fire. Now. Therefore, it becomes clear that Allah multiplies the good deeds of those he wishes felicity, those he wishes felicity for, until they are able to pay off any penalties. SubhanAllah. I, I mean, I do think that it's important for us sometimes to just kind of stop and really think about what's being said. This isn't even about, this isn't even about your good deeds and your bad deeds and like trying to find some balance. This is a reminder that you're going to have a lot to pay other people for on your own PM from the injustices of the tongue and the hand and so forth and suspicion and acting on that suspicion with the other Billah and everything else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Amen. And if after all this there remains even an atom's weight worth of good, Allah will multiply this until he enters paradise through it, because of it. All this by his grace and beneficence. However, who, whomever Allah has decreed misery for, his deeds will not be multiplied to the extent that they are able to pay off his penalties. Instead, any good deeds performed by this latter person will only be multiplied tenfold. L listen to that. Will only be multiplied tenfold because that's the, that's the minimum that Elijah multiplies. Uh -huh. Apportioned amongst his creditors who will accept them all and yet still require further repayment for remaining injustices and therefore, their bad deeds are piled onto his, thereby causing him to enter the fire. This by his justice. And I, I was so um, moved by that statement. I had to read it in a few different, uh, a few different versions just to make sure that's what he was actually saying. Because I didn't remember that from the first time, uh, which, which was a while ago, that I, that I actually read this. So. It, <laughs> Basically, what the author is saying is, if a person's deeds are only multiplied 10 times, which is still from Elias Rogel's grace and his father and his, and his mercy, it's still not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. SubhanAllah. Now, it is in this light. Truly, Allah knows best. Now, it is in this light. And when you get a chance, uh, just go back, read the hadith in the bottom, which is what a lot of this is based on. The hadith uh, of the muflis. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Tadaruna min al muflis, do you know what a bankrupt uh -huh. one is? And they say he's the person who has no money. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, No, it's the one who comes with a mountain's, you know, wor worth of deeds, but he's he's insulted this one, he hit that one, Sefaka Dima had that, right? And he and he, you know, took spilled the blood of this one. So this one takes from his good deeds, this one takes from his good deeds. So you have nothing left. And he's bankrupt. He came, he looked like he had a whole lot. SubhanAllah, but had to give it all away. No. It is in this light that I, 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 I don't like to give this example, but I mean, since the, the climate and the environment, and we, we all know where we are, 
it, you think about that guy that makes makes a g good salary, but he's he's got a lot of different uh, children in different places. All of them wanting that child support. Don't matter. That's a nice check you get at the end, but gotta give it all away. I give it all away. That one takes from it. That one takes from it. That one takes from it. You got nothing left. Making good money. Got to give it all away. Now, it is in this. It is in this light that Yahya ibn Mu'adh said, "When he extends his grace, not a single evil deed remains for that p person. When his justice is brought for forth, not a single good deed remains for that person." You understand? Mercy. Justice. No. It is also established in Bukhari and Muslim, Rahimah Allah, that the Prophet والسلام, said, whoever's account is scrutinized will be destroyed. In another narration, will be punished. And in another narration, will be defeated. Abu Nu'aim. Okay, so here, uh, the author has established his point, which, which is to note that those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on and shows his grace, then they will be the ones who are successful on Yom Al-Qiyamah. And those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just with, right? And it's still he's being just. He's not being oppressive to anyone, but his justice is, is, is equivalent to their misery. Mm. His justice is equivalent to their misery because they don't deserve, they don't deserve Jannah. And what they deserve, in fact, is the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why, so he establishes this with the authentic narrations and he brings the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, Sahih Bukhari Muslim. Now he's going to bring some other narrations from Abu Nu'aym and some Israeliyat, uh, narrations from Bani Israel or, or the, the, the people of the previous book. Uh, I wanted to just point that out. So this next, these next two paragraphs, for example, these are, these are not uh, authentic hadith or anything of that line, anything of that nature. However, uh, Ibn Rajab specifically, many of the authors of the past, after they've established their point, they may mention weak narrations um, as subsidiary or secondary uh, evidence, not that it's being used to establish a principle in and of itself. Is that clear? So they're just mentioning this. To, because it's been narrated in the books. And the point has already been established. Now, Abu Nu'aym records mm -hmm. on the authority of Ali, an, that the Prophet Ali wasalam, said, Allah revealed to a prophet amongst the prophets of the children of Israel, say to those who obey me amongst your nation that they should not overly rely on their deeds, for on the day of judgment, I will not settle the counts of a servant I wish to punish, except that I will punish him. And in other words, if Elijah Joe wants to execute his justice, then that person is going to be punished. Say to those who disobey me amongst your nation that they should not despair, for I readily forgive even the great sins. No. Hadith is weak. No. Abdul Aziz ibn Abu Rawad. Abdul Aziz ibn Abu Rawad said, ah, uh, this is it. Allah inspired Dawood. Alayhi salam saying, Dawood, give glad tidings to the sinners and warn those who give in charity. Surprised, Dawood said, My Lord, why should I give glad tidings to the sinners and warn those who give in charity? He replied, Give glad tidings to the sinners that there is no sin that I find too grievous hmm, to forgive. And warn those who give in charity that there is no servant upon whom I meet, meet out Mm -hmm. My justice and judgment accept that he is destroyed. Now he's going back and he's going to give us some explanation of the hadith which has proceeded on page 28. Whoever's account is scrutinized will be destroyed. Ibn Uyayna said? Ibn Uyayna said, scrutiny here means to undergo the evil of a thorough examination such that nothing is left over. Ibn Yazid said, the severe reckoning is that which contains no pardoning. And the easy reckoning is that in which one's sins are forgiven and good deeds accepted. Mm -hmm. All of these narrations show that the servant cannot possibly succeed without forgiveness, mercy, and the overlooking of his faults. They also show that when Allah enacts pure justice upon the servant, he will certainly 
be destroyed. Okay, so now he's again, and he's emphasizing this point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing his mercy and that a person will not enter Jannah without the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, 1.5. Mm -hmm. Allah's blessings can never be truly repaid. This again is going to emphasize some very important points about our deeds so that we really understand some things. This is where the author is actually started to make his point. Because after we truly believe that our deeds will not enter, into paradise, enter us into paradise, they will not save us from the fire, there has to be some action that is based on that belief. And this is where the author is going to start making that point. Now, mm. this is further clarified by his saying, now. Then you will be asked that day about the pleasures you enjoyed. This verse shows that the servants will be asked about the pleasures they enjoyed in this world. Did they show gratitude for them or not? Ah, gratitude. Gratitude. Do you show gratitude for your favors? What, fa what are favors? Two categories. Worldly favors uh, and religious favors. You thank Allah as a for having blessed you to stand up at night and pray, for praying tarawir, for blessing you to fast the month of Ramadan, for, for, for having the heart to give away in charity, for, for praying five times. Do you thank Allah as a for these favors? You thank him for your worldly favors. Anyone who is required to display gratitude for every favor, such as good health, sound senses, good livelihood, and moreover, will be thoroughly examined, should know that all of his deeds or her deeds taken together cannot repay even some of these favors. Hence, yeah, yeah, that person... Yeah, he, he, left out, he left out part of the translation here, which is, وَتَبْقَى سَائِرُ النِّعَمِ غَيْرَ مُقَابَلَةٍ بِالشُّكْرِ Okay? Which, which means this. So, should know that all of his deeds taken together... Yani, it, no matter what a person does, pull it all together. 50 years of fasting the month of Ramadan, of, of praying on Laylatul Qadr and all of that. Bring it all together. It will not repay even some of the favors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Your ability to hear, your ability to see. It won't be repaid. وَتَبْقَى سَائِرُ النِّعَمْ so even if you thanked and you show gratitude for those, some of those favors with those deeds, the remaining favors will be left without any, what? Without any gratitude being shown. Hence, the person would be deserving of punishment. This is, this is what he's saying here. Now. Khara'ati. Khara'ati, yeah. Khara'ati. I guess the author of Kitab al-Shukr. Correct records on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr عن, that the Prophet والسلام, said this hadith is da'if as well but go ahead read it the servant will be summoned on the day of judgment and he will stand before Allah mighty and magnificent he will say to his angels look at the deeds of my servant and the favors I bestowed upon him they will look and say they don't even amount to one of your favors granted him then he will say look to his evil deeds and good deeds they will look and they will f and find them the same. Whereupon he will say, Servant of mine, I've accepted your good deeds and forgiven you your evil. My favors I have gifted you. Tabarani records on the authority of Ibn Umar, that the Prophet said, A person will be brought on the day of judgment with such deeds that would burden the mountain were they to be placed upon it. Then just one favor from amongst the favors of the law would be displayed and would almost extinguish all those deeds were a law not to distend enlarge them through his mercy. Mm -hmm. Ibn Abi Dunya, Rahimullah, because on the authority of Anas, that the Prophet said, on the day of judgment, Blessings will be brought forward as well as good deeds and bad deeds. Allah will say to just one of his blessings, take your due, take your due from his good deeds, and it will take all his good deeds. 
He also records the Wahab ibn Munab, Munabbih said, a servant worshipped Allah for 50 years. Allah inspired him with the words, I have forgiven you. In other words, the, the man, يعني, oh, ilayhi, and qad lak. يعني, the man was inspired, heard this, I, I don't know what you want to call it, a voice or whatever, but basically he's hearing Allah as well say to him, I have forgiven you. He responds and say, forgive me for what? I haven't committed a sin. La ilaha illallah. Thereupon. May Allah protect us. Thereupon Allah ordered a vein in his neck to throb painfully such that he could not pray or sleep. After a while, it was cured. And an angel came to him, and to him he complained about the vein. The angel said to him, Your Lord, mighty and magnificent, says, Your worship for the last 50 years equates to the soothing of that vein. You understand? After Elias was ill, cured him from his pain. He said that the cure that came, all of that worship you did for the last 50 years, that just equals that cure. It, 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 obviously, this is not a hadith from the Prophet I was saying, but it, it, it's from the hikam to just show that many of the blessings that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives us go unthanked. Mm -hmm. We don't even realize, we don't, and we take it for granted. I'm, I'm going to read for the sake of time. I think we only have four or five minutes till the end. What time? What time is it? Oh no, we have eight minutes. Let me let me read um, because we we have to. I really want to get to this point. It needs to flow with what we're covering right now. Hakim records on the authority of Javed that the Prophet said that Jibril said, a servant worshipped the law on the top of a mountain in the middle of an ocean for 500 years. Then he asked his Lord to let him die in the state of prostration. 500 years, okay? We used to pass by him each time we would descend, yani the angels, and ascend, and we would find written in the pre eternal knowledge that he would be resurrected on the day of judgment and would stand before Allah, mighty and magnificent. The Lord would say, enter my servant into paradise by virtue of my mercy. The servant will say, my Lord, rather by virtue of my deeds. I've been, what? I've been worshiping you five Ooh. years. Let me enter Jannah by my deeds. This will happen three times, and Allah will say to his angels, weigh my favors against his deeds. And they will find that the blessing of sight alone takes up all of the deeds he did during his 500 years of worship. With the other bodily blessings still remaining, he will say, enter my servant into the fire. He will be dragged towards the fire and will cry out, Enter me into paradise by virtue of your mercy. Enter me into paradise by virtue of your mercy. Thereupon he shall enter paradise. Jibril went on to say, Muhammad, so large son of things, only happen by the mercy of Allah. Obviously, this hadith also is not authentic. Um, the, the, the author, however, by bringing various narrations, is proving the, the fundamental, the, the foundational point here, which is that your, the, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can't possibly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can't possibly thank him for his favors. Right? And so what remains after that is a lack of gratitude because you haven't shown enough gratitude. And that alone is enough that if Allah wanted to hold you to account with his justice, right, that that would be enough alone for, for punishment. Whoever understands all of what has preceded will realize, okay, now, this, I want you to Put like stars next to this paragraph right here. Whoever understands all of what has proceeded will realize that his deeds, even if they are great, are not sufficient to merit his success and in entry into paradise or salvation from the fire in and of themselves. As such, he will no longer over rely on his deeds or be impressed by them. Alhamdulillah. Circle it. Yes, sir. Al-Ujb. Al-Ujb. Yani that he's impressed with himself. Mm. He's so self-righteous. He's done so much good. I have done this for Islam, and I have done that. And I am the greatest thing since sliced bread. Even if they be great and wonderful. Look at that. As such, he will know this is the result. This is what he wants us to get out of this. Number one, we talked about the shukr for Allah's favors. And he wants to make sure that if we understand this principle, that your deeds are not all that, you will not become self-impressed. 
Because if you become self-impressed, then that will lead to al-kibr. And kibr was the them of Iblis. And it was what led him to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And kibr is the asl of kufr. And perhaps we talk a little bit about more about that next week when we get there, inshallah. If this is the case of great and many deeds, so we're talking about somebody who's actually striving to worship Allah, what then would one think of the paltry deeds of the many? I mean, many people who don't even try, barely do anything. Such a person should ponder his deficiency in worship. I mean, the person who doesn't is not doing enough or a lot. Should ponder his deficiency in worship and devote himself to penitence and repentance. 1.6, one of the greatest blessings is shukr. One of the greatest blessings is shukr. As regards one whose deeds are great and many. So this is the opposite. So look, look, look above. It says, what then would one think of the paltry deeds of the many? So the person who's not doing enough, then his issue should be what? Pondering his deficiency and devoting himself to tawbah, turning himself around. Okay, what about the one who does a lot? As regards to ones whose deeds are great and many, he must busy himself with showing gratitude for them. For the accord to show gratitude is one of the greatest blessings Allah bestows upon his servant. It is obligatory upon him to meet these deeds with gratitude and realize his deficiency in displaying due gratitude. He's not showing enough, even if you're doing a lot. Wahb ibn al-Ward, when asked about the reward of particular deed, asked, said, ask not about its reward, but ask about the gratitude due upon one who was guided to it. How do I thank you, Allah, for this reward, for, for, the, for, this, for this act of worship that you guided me to? Not, what's the reward for this, and what if I do that, what do I get? Not, but, uh, how, ya Rab, how can I thank you for this, for guiding me to this? Abu Sulaiman would say, how can an intelligent person be amazed with his deeds? Right. Deeds are one of Allah's blessing. As such, it is upon him to show gratitude and to show humility. It is only the qadariya who are amazed at their deeds. The qadariya, as we talked about before, they're the ones that believe they create their own deeds. That is, those who do not believe that the actions of the servant are created by Allah mighty and magnificent. Mm -hmm. How excellent is the saying of Abu Bakr uh, and I, from what I Oh, and Nashali. Yeah. On the day that Dawood al Ta'i died, after his burial, Ibn Samak stood and he praised him for his good deeds and, he, and wept, causing all present to weep, as well as to testify to the truth of what he said. In other words, he's standing at the grave of, grave of Dawood al Ta'i and he's talking about what he did for Islam and what he did and, what I, and, all, and all of that. And, and he made everybody cry, and everybody was like, yeah, he did all these great things for his name. Abu Bakr and Nashali stood, and he said, oh, Allah, forgive him and show mercy to him, and leave him not to his deeds. Don't leave him to his deeds. His deeds ain't going to be enough. <clears throat> Abu Dawud records on the authority of Zayb and Thabit, radiallahu anhu, that the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, were Allah to punish the inhabitants of the heavens and the inhabitants of the earth, he would do so without having oppressed them in any way. Whew. Were he to show them his mercy, were he to show them mercy, his mercy would be better for them than their deeds. This is the rule right there. That hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, and it is sahih. Okay? Were Allah to punish the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth, he would do so without having oppressed them in any way. And were he to show them mercy, his mercy is better for them than their deeds. Hakim records on the authority of Jabir, radiallahu anhu. That a man came to the Prophet and said, Sin, sins, repeating this two or three times. The Messenger says, Say, Allah, your forgiveness is vaster than my sins, and I have more hope in it, yani in your forgiveness, than I do my deeds. He said this, and the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Repeat it. He did so, and he was ordered to repeat it again, which he did. Then he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Stand, for you have been forgiven. My sins, were I but to ponder them, are copious. But greater yet is my Lord's forgiveness. In my righteous deeds, lies not my expectation, but in the mercy of Allah, I have, have I anticipation. <clears throat> Acknowledging the grace of Allah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. This, uh, all right, call it then, inshallah. Uh, but I, I stay, stay, because I, I want to um, finish this between then and the comment, inshallah. All right, page 36, we're almost done, inshallah. Acknowledging the grace of Allah. 
Now that this noble principle has been established, it is known that deeds in and of themselves do not necessitate or bring about salvation from the fire and entry into paradise, let alone necessitating the ascension to the uppermost levels of paradise, the levels of those brought close and Mokarabun, and seeing the face of the Lord of the worlds. And it is known that this can only come to pass through the mercy of Allah, his grace and forgiveness. Okay. Again, it only happens through what? The mercy of Allah, his grace, his forgiveness. Then what should our question be right there? How do we get Allah's mercy? Not, not, again, not what deeds, right? Uh, I'm going to rely on this deed to get me into Jannah. What do I do to get Allah's mercy? And did Allah not explain to us that in the Quran? This then requires the believer to abandon thinking highly of his deeds and to look solely to the grace of Allah and his blessing. Tight. Before we get to the next part, I just want us to, to, to real quick, the benefit of knowing this principle that we're studying is number one, it kills ujb, that, that self-righteousness and vanity. It kills it. Because you have no ground for it to stand on. And when you kill kibir, and this, we'll, we'll talk about this next week, inshallah, I'll bring some, some other statements from the ulama on this. It, it, it opens up the door for so much of Allah's with Allah's mercy that is closed for those who are arrogant. The second thing, and this the author also talked about this, it should increase us in gratitude. It should increase us in gratitude. Not that we uh, are, are so, uh, you know, amazed by, by the works that we've done, but that we are so thankful that Allah with Allah has guided us to doing them. All right? Now, one of the Gnostics was asked. I don't, I don't like using that term Gnostics. The, the Arabic is an Um feed, mean, which is uh, it's, it's Sufi terminology, which was uh, borrowed from the Christian Gnostics, the Christian mystics, um, which their mysticism infected mean, the, the, the early or, or the, the, the latter Sufis of Islam, we should say. It's different from the early group, but anyway. So I don't really like that translation, um, but we'll use it for now. One of the Gnostics was asked, which deed is best? He replied, realizing the grace of Allah, mighty and magnificent. He then recited, if quantities were able to aid in any way, they would join the obtuse with the judicious. When all of this is understood, here we go. It is obligatory upon a believer and servant, the servant who desires salvation from the fire, entry into paradise, who desires to be close to his master and to look on at his face, to seek all of this by taking to the means that lead to Allah's mercy, pardon, forgiveness, pleasure, and love. It is in this way that he will attain his munificence. The means are the various deeds Allah has appointed. Only those deeds that he has legislated upon the tongue of his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Only those deeds that his messenger told us would serve to draw us closer to Allah. Those deeds that he loves and leads to his pleasure and forgiveness. Allah the Exalted says, Inna rahmatallahi qareebun min al-muhsineen. Allah's mercy is close to the muhsineen. Then we should be looking to be people of ihsan. Because Allah's mercy is close to those people and we want Allah's mercy. وَرَحْمَتِي وَسِعَتْ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ فَسَأَكْتُبُهَا لِلَّذِينَ يَتَّقُونَ My mercy extends to all things, and I will write it, prescribe it for those who have taqwa. Therefore, we should try to be people of ihsan and people of taqwa. So it is obligatory upon the servant to seek out those traits of taqwa and ihsan that Allah has legislated in his book or upon the tongue of his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and having done so, draw closer to Allah mighty and magnificent through enacting them. There's no other path that can lead to the goal of the believing servant. This is where we're going to pick up next week, inshallah ta'ala. But for homework, what I want you to do is find the eight places in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So that you attain mercy. Find those places in the Quran where Allah Azawajal says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Seven places where Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ One place where He says, what? لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ All right? Find those places in the Quran because from there, you'll be able to work backwards and see the people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he will have mercy on. And that's what we're striving for. And this is one of the things that we benefit from the principle, none of you will be saved by his deeds alone. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy and for his grace. Save us from the punishment of the fire to enter us into paradise. Hadha wallahu a'ala wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak. Nabiya Muhammad subhanahu wa ta'ala wa alayhi wa sallam 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 wa alayhi wa s